So each branch of science attempts unifying theories. Physics, for example, has, has thermodynamics to bring together um, mechanics and heat. Einstein's relativity added to the unification um, of ideas, underscoring how fundamental qualities, uh, quantities like matter and energy, are just two sides of the same coin. We now have wave-particle duality and a common framework for understanding special relativity in the context of quantum mechanics. Yet the ultimate grand unified theory of everything, a the theory of quantum gravity, remains elusive. Biology, on the other hand, has its grand unifying theory, thanks to Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, published in uh, 1859, combined with the theory of heredity pioneered by Mendel, published a few years later. And it's the story of this theory of heredity that this lecture concerns, made up, as you shall see, of a series of revolutionary ideas pioneered by some of the greatest scientists that the world has ever known. It's an exciting story because it concerns the revolution in our molecular understanding of the very nature of life itself. And it is a very exciting time to be telling this story because we're entering a period when we don't just understand the ultimate influence of genetics on, on, on life, but we're developing the power to intervene in our genetic destiny. Now is the time to understand how this has come about, what it means, and how we should move forward, not just as scientists, but as a society. Darwin's big idea was that the variation among creatures in their natural environment result, results in the struggle for life in which only the most suitably adapted will survive. Evolution basically, oops, going the wrong way. Evolution basically means gradual change over time, and natural selection provides a mechanism for evolution. Some change will be favored. It will make the organism more likely to survive in a particular environment and reproduce, producing progeny with the same traits, as you can see with Darwin's finches. So you see, ultimately, one type of creature can be transformed into something completely different. In illustrating his theory of evolution by natural selection, Darwin realized that all species are connected. Indeed, they share a common origin. He thought of the concept of the tree of life. And that's Darwin's notes on, on his idea of the tree of life. Darwin's tree was a simple one, and we now know it to be more complex. Quite a lot more complex. But Darwin was right. Um, all, all species are indeed connected. Simple life forms evolved four billion years ago, and natural selection has sent organisms off in a myriad of different directions to make the extraordinary di diversity we have around us today. Over nine million species. And that represents only a tiny minority of species that have ever lived. Darwin talked passionately about the grandeur of his view of life, with its endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful that he described in his book. And Darwin's theory of natural selection works, to, works, works well as a unifying theory in biology. It works so well, in fact, that Theodosius Dobzhansky, um, writing about 100 years later, was prompted to say, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's Theodosius Dobzhansky's quote there. But there was a problem with Darwin's big idea. And the problem with Darwin's great idea was that Darwin had no ro robust mechanism to explain inheritance. And this rendered his logic incomplete. His unifying theory failed in this respect. Darwin knew, of course, that traits run in families. Otherwise, natural selection wouldn't work at all. But he had no decent mechanism to explain how inheritance works, despite recognizing the supreme importance of heredity, this modification by descent in his hypothesis. So what were the prevailing theories of heredity in Darwin's time? Among the earliest known writings on the subject of heredity are those of Hippocrates in 400 BC. 
That's Hippocrates. He believed that reproductive material came from all parts of an organism, and hence that characters were directly handed down to the progeny. As evidence for this hypothesis, he referred to a race of mankind called the macrocephaly. Immediately after a child was born, the macrocephaly fashioned its head by hand to give it an elongated shape. At a later period, the elongated, uh, a later period, the elongated head would form naturally without the necessity for moulding it soon after birth, in much the same way that baldness and blue eyes are inherited. If reproductive material came from all parts of an organism, then it would come from the moulded head. Fifty years or so later, Aristotle had another go at, um, at a theory of heredity, and he questioned uh, Hippocrates' view. He couldn't understand how certain characteristics like voice and nails and hair could contribute to the reproductive material because they were so intangible, or well, they might even be made up of dead tissue. He also observed that children sometimes look more like their grandparents than their, present, than their parents. And he was worried about plants. How could parts which might be missing at the time of reproduction, like leaves, for example, how could they be inherited? And how could it be? How could it be that parents could each contribute something from all of their parts, yet their progeny have only one and not two of everything? So Aristotle modified Hippocrates' theory by postulating that the reproductive material is made up of substances that have been diverted from various parts to the reproductive path. And this was a really important idea. He went on to argue, however, that the contributions to the progeny from the two parents are not equal and held the contribution of the father in somewhat higher regard. No surprises there. So the father's contribution was shape and form to the embryo as opposed to the mother's contribution of inner material. In other words, all the dull stuff. Many variations of these transmission theories were proposed over the subsequent centuries. The only theory of heredity that has perhaps rivaled this, the, the transmission theories, is the preformation theory, which can be followed back to St. Augustine. And this theory held that um, the creation, in the creation of the first woman, all the following generations were preformed. And the theory gave rise to the idea of the homunculus, you can see here in the 16th century. Although Nicholas Hartziker, who drew this homunculus in 1695, was definitely a spermist in his view of heredity. Transmission theories, however, did dominate during, during Darwin's time. And thus Darwin, writing in 1868 about his theory of pangenesis in this paper here, Animals and Plants Under Domestication, he suggested that all the cells and tissues of an organism threw off minute granules, which he called gemules, and he thought that these must be circulated through the organism and multiplied and were passed down to the reproductive cells, which thus contained a multitude of components thrown off from each individual part of the organism. He also thought gemules were capable of transmission in a dormant state to future generations. So Darwin had a way of explaining the non-expression of, of parental characteristics as well as the direct transmission of characteristics from parents to offspring that was so important for his theory of natural selection. He felt that pangenesis, which he described as a provisional hypothesis in his 1868 work, he thought this brought together, in his words, a multitude of facts which are at present left disconnected by any cause. His theory was not, however, so very different from that of Hippocrates over 2,000 years previously. And it's remarkable that the Hippocratic view remained essentially unchallenged for 23 centuries. It's not as though no one did any breeding experiments during this time, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. It's more the case that although these experiments did not support the classical view, they didn't present any alternative hypothesis until Mendel. It's noteworthy, however, that several decades before Mendel published his work, at least two other plant breeders made very similar observations to Mendel. Knight, working in England in 1799, crossed unpigmented and pigmented edible peas together. And he was surprised to find that only pigmented plants grew in the following year, the first generation, the first filial generation. But that these, on self-pollination, produced both pigmented and unpigmented plants. From this, he deduced that there was a stronger tendency to produce coloured than colourless 
plants. Goss, uh, also working in England in 1824, made similar discoveries, but he took the analysis slightly further. And he was working with yellow and green seeded peas. So he pollinated green seeded peas from a yellow seeded variety, and he found all yellow seeded plants in the first generation. And then when he selfed those, again, uh, he got pods with all green, all yellow, or a mixture of both green and yellow seeded plants the following year. But then he went for a further generation, and he discovered that while the green peas bred true, only giving green progeny, the yellow yielded a mixture. Some pods all yellow, some with both green and yellow intermixed. So why didn't Knight and Goss discover the theory of heredity? What was their problem? Well, their problem was that they didn't count the numbers of the two kinds of peas, or if they did count them, they failed to see the significance of the numbers. And in doing so, they both failed to discover the hereditary mechanism which Mendel found. 42 years later, in 1866, Mendel had been doing similar experiments to Knight and Goss, and these are actually some pages from Mendel's notebook. But his thoroughness in recording the minutiae of his data enabled him, by a stroke of genius, to detect the underlying mechanism, and so to put forward an entirely new hypothesis for heredity. The grandeur in Mendel's work is easily obscured by seemingly obscure facts and figures about pea breeding schemes. But on the contrary, the devil is absolutely in the detail. The grandeur is revealed by the seemingly mundane. Working with the pigmented and unpigmented peas, just like Knight, Mendel also noted that he only got pigmented plants in the first generation, and that when he self-pollinated these, he got pigmented and unpigmented varieties in the next generation, the F2 generation. But he counted the numbers of each kind. And he found... 705 pigmented plants and 224 unpigmented plants among 929 plants in total. And he observed that these frequencies were close to three quarters and one quarter of the total. He called the pigmented characteristic present in all the immediate progeny of the cross and three quarters of the following generation, he called that one dominant. And the unpigmented trait, recessive. In other words... Inheritance is particulate. It's not a case of blending parental characteristics like mixing paint. Mendel also worked on the yellow-green seed colour characteristic first explored by Goss. And he confirmed that yellow is dominant to green and that both kinds appear in the second generation after crossing. But again, he counted his peas. And out of 8,023 plants, 6,022 were yellow and 2,001 were green. Again, a close approximation of three quarters to one quarter, or a three to one ratio. Mendel confirmed Goss's observation that the green peas bred true, but he went much further. He found that of 519 yellow pods, 166 bred true, whereas 353 did not, instead giving yellow and green seeds in the same three to one ratio as in the previous generation. Mendel figured that the 166 pure breeding to 353 impure breeding was a close fit with a 1 to 2 ratio of the total. In other words, the F2 ratio of 3 dominant to 1 recessive was really a ratio of 1 pure breeding dominant to 2 impure dominant to 1 recessive, which always breeds true. He pursued these plants for several generations and showed that the pure breeding types always remained pure breeding, and the impure breeding ones always gave the same 1 to 2 to 1 ratio in each, subsequent, in each subsequent generation. Mendel was very cautious about his data. And he went on to repeat his experiments with seven other characteristics. One character was al always dominant to its alternative, he found. And the second generation always gave a 3 to 1 ratio, which on closer inspection turned out to be a disguised 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So what does this all mean? This is a scary pea slide, right? And I promise it's the only one. Mendel built a hypothesis to account for his data in which he used symbols for his traits. He used a capital letter for a dominant trait and a small letter for uh, a lowercase letter for a recessive character. So it could be big Y in the case of these yellow seeds, seeded plants, and little y for the green ones. And it's clear from this that he was thinking about factors or determinants responsible for the manifestation of the character. This is absolutely crucial 
So Mendel's hypothesis. His characters were not transmitted directly from generation to generation, according to the classical theory, but rather they are discrete particles responsible for the appearance of particular characters. Furthermore, each individual receives one particle from each of its two parents in respect of a particular character. And these two particles separate uncontaminated when the reproductive cells are generated. So if big Y, um, if, if, if big y denotes the particle that determines yellow seeds and little y green, then the parents, big Y, big Y, and little y, little y, give rise to the offspring, big Y, little y. Now these will be yellow because the character is dominant. But self-pollination of these will give, will give these progeny. It'll give little y, little y, big y, little y, big y, little y, and little y, little y. This is crazy to talk about, isn't it? When you, i.e. three yellow to one green at the phenotypic ratio, but that is really a disguised one to two to one ratio when you consider the factors themselves. A further point which didn't escape Mendel's reasoning was that egg cells carrying big y were is equally likely to be fertilized by pollen carrying big y or little y. In other words, fertilization was random between egg cells and pollen cells, or egg cells and sperm cells, if you were thinking about animals, regardless of what factors they carried. This later became known as his law of equal segregation. Mendel was sitting on a revolution of incalculable proportion, but nobody noticed. He published his work in 1866. That's two years before... Darwin published his pangenesis theory of blending inheritance based on his gemmules made from all parts of the organism. It seems extraordinary in these days of instant communication that Darwin never came into contact with Mendel's work. Isn't that absolutely extraordinary? What would have happened if Darwin and Mendel had met and discussed Mendel's results? Darwin would surely have been perplexed that Mendel's F1Ps weren't yellowish-green but rather that the mode of inheritance suggested by Mendel's work was most definitely particular. I wonder what he would have said. As it happened, Mendel's work was almost entirely overlooked for 34 years, being rediscovered in 1900, coincidentally, by three different scientists, De Vries, Correns, and von Tischemack, working on a variety of different plant species. Corrins introduced, introduced the term Mendel's Regel or Mendel's Law for the basic principle, namely the segregation of the discrete particulate determinants of alternative characteristics when reprodu reproductive cells, we would now call these gametes, are formed and their reassociation at fertilization. De Vries is credited with introducing the term mutation to describe suddenly appearing variations which could provide the raw material for natural selection. Bateson and Saunders, working in 1902, were the first to apply Mendelian law to an animal species. They looked at the domestic fowl, Gallus domesticus, and they found that an extra toe was dominant to the normal foot. Bateson and Saunders also applied Mendelian theory to earlier unexplained data and even re-examined Darwin's 1868 work on the snapdragon, Antirhinum majus. One form of the snapdragon, the peloric form, differs in having um, a radially symmetrical flower instead of the normal irregular tulip variety. Darwin interpreted the results of his crosses as indicating that the tendency to produce normal flowers prevailed in the F1 generation, but that the tendency to pelorism appeared to gain strength by the intermission of a generation. With Mendel's theory, it was only necessary to postulate that the peloric trait was recessive. It disappeared in the F1 generation and reappeared in F2, in the one to three ratio. Thus, the classical and Mendelian theories of heredity can be very clearly teased apart. In the classical theory, something is transmitted directly from each, of the, each part of the organism, for example, the snapdragon flower, to the corresponding part in the progeny, whereas in the Mendelian world, inheritance is indirect through the agency of particular determinants. It's these determinants that are transmitted from generation to generation. And the character of the flower, or whatever it is you're looking at, that develops is simply the fortuitous combination of the set of determinants that it happens to receive at fertilization. The contribution of each parent retains their integrity rather than blending with the contribution of the other parent. And crucially, the determinant is not, re is not modified 
by its presence in the organism. Thus, the inheritance of the remodeled head in the Hippocratic example, given in support of the classical theory, is impossible. The major problem in biology in the early 1900s, though, following the rediscovery of Mendel's work, was that its relevance to evolution was unclear and hotly debated. Variation in wild populations looked continuous, like the products of blending inheritance. It looks much more like a blending inheritance model, not the discrete model proposed by Mendel. And how could you account for large jumps in new species with this model? Well, crucial to the solving of this problem was the study of populations in the field, an area we, could, we would now call population genetics. R.A. Fisher was the major figure in the development of the so-called modern synthesis, producing in 1918 his seminal paper, The Correlation Between Relatives on the Supposition of Mendelian Inheritance. It sounds really dull, but it was far from that. What Fisher did crucially in this paper was to show that continuous variation could be the result of the action of many discrete determinants. We would now call these genetic loci. Therefore, Mendelian genetics was, in fact, completely consistent with the idea of evolution driven by natural selection. The application of Mendelian principles to populations was furthered in the 1920s, 30s and 40s by Fisher, along with J.B.S. Haldane, we've heard about from, from, from Malcolm, and Sewell Wright, Dobzhansky, E.B. Ford, Ernst Mayer, and others. But time is not going to allow me to give due credit to their crucial work on the maintenance of genetic diversity, on genetic polymorphism, and the mechanism by which new species become reproductively isolated. Nevertheless, this new work on population genetics is my second revolution in genetics, following Mendel's great theory, theory of heredity in 1866 and its rediscovery in 1900. The second revolution resulted in the grand unifying theory of biology. The paradigm of evolution by natural selection with an integrated mechanism for heredity that could be applied to populations. Variation at the genetic level or mutation provides the raw material required for natural selection to sculpt evolution over many generations. The third revolution has to be the chromosomal theory. It's all well and good talking about factors and particles of inheritance, but what are they and where are they? Well, the where was answered by Thomas Hunt Morgan. It's Thomas Hunt Morgan. At about the same time that the modern synthesis was being developed, the what had to wait a few years. Bizarrely, Thomas Hunt Morgan was born in Kentucky in 1866, the very year that Mendel published his work. By the time that Morgan began, to, began his work on the fruit fly Drosophila in 1910, Mendel's discoveries were codified into two main laws. The first rule we've already come across, the law of equal segregation. The second rule was known as the rule of free combinations. We would now call this the law of independent assortment. And this states that when new generations arise, the different hereditary factors can form new combinations independently of each other. Mendel found this out when he did his so-called dihybrid crosses. For example, if a tall purple-flowered plant is crossed with a short white-flowered variety, the factors purple and white can be inherited independently of the factors tall and short. You'll end up with tall white-flowered plants and so on in precisely predictable ratios. But Morgan's particular genius was that he spotted some inconsistencies in the second law and then had the confidence to seek an explanation for them. Morgan found the first discrepancy when he crossed flies that had purple eyes and short wings. Go with me on this one. With those that had red eyes and normal wings, right? The purple, the purple eyes are PR and PR plus is the red eyes because plus in genetics means normal, right? And VG is the short wings and VG plus is the normal wings, again, because... Plus means, means normal. Now, under Mendel's second law, Morgan expected to get purple-eyed flies with normal wings out of his crossing scheme at the same frequency as getting his red-eyed normal-winged flies back again because the factors should assort independently from one another. But this was not the case at all. He got the purple-eyed normal-winged flies out, but only extremely rarely. Morgan's great leap forward was to figure that the eye colour trait and the wing size traits must be physically connected to one another in some way. 
that's diagrammed out here. He called this phenomenon linkage. And he found that there were many examples of this in his fly crosses. But importantly, that the linkage relationships were confined to four combination groups. Now, in parallel to all this work with fly crosses, the early cell biologists were busy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the importance of their work was not lost on Morgan. The mechanism of fertilization had been discovered by Hertwig in 1875, working on sea urchins. And Weissmann took to the microscope in the 1880s, having distinguished between the hereditary, hereditary material, the germplasm, or germline, giving rise to the gametes, and the rest of the body, the soma, to propose that the nucleus of the male and female germ cells must be the bearers of hereditary qualities. Much earlier than this, several disciples of the new cell biology had observed thread-like structures in cells named chromosomes. Chromosome means coloured body because that's what they could see down the microscope. And this was first noted in 1888 by Heinrich von Waldier Hartz. This um, slide here is actually one from uh, a drawing from Walter Fleming in 1885 from the, um, the salivary gland of a midge. But nobody knew what these things were for. On the rediscovery of Mendel's work in the early 1900s, Sutton and Bovary independently suggested that chromosomes were good candidates for the exact distribution of hereditary factors at the genesis of a new individual, simply because of the proportion of the chromosomes in germ cells before and after fertilization. In the chromosomes, factors could be combined or could come apart because there were double the number of chromosomes in the somatic cells compared with the sex cells. And I just want to show you a movie at this point, one of my favorite movies, because it's of my worms. C. elegans, of an embryo of the worm. And I, I want you to look at the bottom one, because that's the one that's going to undergo this process of fertilization. And what we're going to see are the, is the nucleus from the male and the female, the male and female pronuclei, and they're going to come together and they're going to fuse, hopefully. And that really is the thing that marks the beginning. You see that fusion? That's the thing that marks the beginning of a new life. And, you, and, and then after that, the cells will undergo division and, and so on and so forth. But that, that first thing, I'm going to play it back because it's... Well, it won't let me play it back because it... Anyway, once it's done that, then um, that's really the beginning of life. I always find that amazing to watch down the microscope. And this, this process of... So the, 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 the gametes have half the amount of genetic material from the mother and the father. So when they get together, they reconstitute the whole again. The process of halving the number of chromosomes during the generation of these sex cells or gametes is called meiosis. It's a reduction or division. And Sutton and Bovary's idea of chromosomes distributing hereditary factors during the formation of gametes had huge resonance with Mendel's first law of equal segregation. So the ground was well prepared for Morgan to link cell biology and heredity. The linkage group of connected hereditary factors turned out to be chromosomes. And the number of such combination groups or linkage groups turned out to be the same as the number of chromosomes in an organism. Four in the case of a fly, 23 in us. Morgan's discovery of linkage completely proved and greatly extended the chromosomal theory of inheritance proposed by Sutton and Bovary, just from looking down microscopes. Morgan's linkage rule limited, to a large extent, Mendel's second law as being more applicable to hereditary factors residing on different chromosomes. Morgan published his chromosome map with different hereditary factors lined up in chromosomes like beads on a necklace. You can see here. However, there was more. Morgan found inconsistency in his own linkage theory. He found that even when his factors were connected on the same chromosome, he could still see what looked like a degree of independent assortment, even though it was rare. Remember the purple-eyed, normal-winged flies? Well, he did get some of them, and he called this phenomenon crossing over. He envisaged the physical exchange of parts between chromosomes occurring at the crossover points, or chiasmata, as you could see them in certain in certain cells, and this is the grasshopper testis. I always wonder how people came about, you know, how they started looking in these weird and wonderful systems, but you can see crossing over really, really well in the grasshopper testis. 
The theory of crossing over, though, was greeted with much scepticism at the time, until 1931, when Harriet Crichton and Barbara McClintock were able to visualize reciprocal exchange of genetic material at much higher resolution. Nowadays, of course, we would call this process of genetic exchange recombination, and it's an extremely important mechanism for generating genetic diversity during reproduction. So the third revolution is the chromosomal theory of inheritance, linking Mendelian ideas of heredity into the physical structure of chromosomes, which behave as to obey Mendel's first law, but disobey his second, at least where factors are linked on the same chromosome. Morgan's work was utterly extraordinary. Who would have thought it would be possible to localize in these chromosomes, which are only a micrometer or so long, that's one thousandth of a millimeter, thousands of hereditary factors, accounting for all of the characters that makes every organism what it is, and do it all by analyzing the results of fruit fly crosses. When Morgan got the Nobel Prize in 1933, his work was likened to the astronomical calculation of celestial bodies still unseen, but later on found by the telescope. But more, more so. It was said that Morgan's predictions exceeded this by far because they mean something principally new, something that has not been observed before. In Morgan's own words, that the fundamental aspects of heredity should have turned out to be so extraordinarily simple supports us in the hope that nature may, after all, be entirely accessible. Her much-advertised inscrutability has once more been found to be an illusion due to our ignorance. This is encouraging, for if the world in which we live was as complicated as some of our friends would have us believe, we might well despair that biology could ever become an exact science. The term gene was first coined in 1909 by Johansson to describe physical and functional units of heredity. He took the word from, from Darwin's word of pangenesis. But the role of genes wasn't clarified until the 1940s in a landmark study by George Beadle and Edward Tatum that takes us to the start of our fourth revolution, the molecular biology revolution. This major revolution actually consists of several sub-revolutions, some of which seem to get more airtime than others. But for simplicity and in the interests of time, I've lumped together about 40 years of really important work and several of these sub-revolutions and will now attempt a whistle-stop tour, which takes us up to the 1980s. Beadle and Tatum were working on the haploid fungus Neurospora. They irradiated Neurospora to induce mutations and then tested cultures for interesting mutant phenotypes. They found numerous mutants that had defective nutrition, for example, in the biosynthetic pathway uh, uh, by which arginine is made in the cell. They were able to block the pathway at different steps with different mutants, eventually figuring that each gene controlled one specific enzyme in a series of interconnected steps in a biochemical pathway. This was the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Beadle and Tatum's work was a significant unifying concept because it provided a bridge between two important research areas, genetics and biochemistry. So sub-revolution number one of revolution four is the one gene, one enzyme, or one protein hypothesis. But what were genes made of? Well, to answer this question, we need to start with Frederick Griffiths in 1928, performing experiments on the bacterium Streptococcus pneumoniae. Some strains of the bacterium are lethal when injected into mice, while other non-virulent strains are not. You can see here. Griffiths made the puzzling observation that if he injected the non-virulent strain into mice, together with a heat-killed virulent strain, which on its own would not be lethal, the mice died. Live bacterial cells could be recovered from the dead mice, which were virulent when injected into live mice. So how did this happen? Somehow, the cell debris of the heat-killed virulent cells had converted the non-virulent live cells into virulent ones. In other words, the cells had become transformed. Now we fast forward to 1944, when Oswald Avery, working with two colleagues, McLeod and McCarty, set out to chemically destroy all the major components of the dead cells one by one and test if the extract had lost the ability to transform. You can guess what they found, can't you? DNA. Not polysaccharides or protein or fat or RNA, just DNA, plain and simple. DNA is the transforming principle. 
And this was the first demonstration that genes are composed of DNA. So sub-revolution number two, DNA is the genetic material contained in genes. Between you and me, this was a bit of a letdown. How could such a low-complexity molecule as DNA encode the diversity of all life on the planet? <laughs> DNA was already known, you see, because it was first isolated in, in 1869 by Meischer. He got it from pus. He went to clinics and got pus because they had lots of these white blood cells and with big nuclei, and then he grew them all up and he got, got lots of nuclei in. But following Meisch's discovery of DNA, the Russian biochemist Levine worked out that DNA was a polynucleotide in 1919. And he did what biochemists like to do, is chop things up. He did, used hydrolysis in his case. And each nucleotide, um, he found, was composed of just one of four nucleotide bases, a sugar molecule, and a phosphate group. So that's sub-revolution number three. DNA is composed of four nucleotide bases, a sugar molecule, and a phosphate group. Levine proposed what he called the tetranucleotide structure, in which nucleotides were always arranged in the same order. G-C-T-A, G-C-T-A, G-C-T-A. But scientists eventually realized that this was oversimplistic and that the order of nucleotides is, in fact, highly variable. Sub-revolution number four, the order of bases in a DNA molecule is variable. Perhaps it can act as a code. It was Shargaff who worked out that the amount of adenine, or A, is usually similar to the amount of thymine, or T, and the amount of guanine, G, usually approximates the amount of cytosine, or C. Shargaff was very inspired by Avery's 1944 paper. He wrote, Avery gave us the first text of a new language, or rather, he showed us where to look for it. I resolved to search for this text. Sub-revolution number five, A equals T, C equals G. Shargaff's work, together with some crucially important X-ray crystallography work by English researchers Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins, paved the way for Watson and Crick's derivation of the three-dimensional double helical model for the structure of DNA in 1953. In their Nature paper, Watson and Crick began, we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribose nucleic acid DNA. This structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. No kidding. This was no mean feat. You could fit 25,000 strands of DNA side by side in the width of a single human hair. And this is sub-revolution number six, one of the biggies, DNA structure. One long molecule spiraling around in a double helix. Exquisite, simple, ordered, regular. Two strands, each with a strong backbone made of sugar and phosphate with the bases on the inside, A pairing with T and C with G. Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA is considered by some to be the most important biological discovery of the 20th century. The reason for this is that the double helix structure fulfilled the three requirements for a hereditary substance. Firstly, sequence. The four bases make up an alphabet of four letters, a genetic code, to specify the sequence of amino acids in proteins, known to be crucial for cellular functions. Fred Sanger had determined the first protein amino acid sequence of insulin in 1951. So the amino acid sequence was begging for some kind of genetic code. Perhaps the genetic code could write information in DNA as a sequence of nucleotides and then translate it into a different language of amino acid sequences in a protein. Secondly, if the base sequence of DNA specifies the amino acid sequence of, in proteins, then change or mutation is possible by the substitution of, of one type of base for another at one or more positions. And this would give rise to altered proteins and likely altered cellular function. This is heavy stuff. Mutation would account for the genetic variation investigated by Mendel and the driving force of natural selection in Darwinian evolution. No wonder Francis Crick burst into the Eagle pub in Cambridge on February the 28th, 1953, and said, we have discovered the secrets of life. Thirdly, copying. As Watson and Crick stated in the concluding words of their paper, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. If you have pairing, 
and free nucleotides in the cell and enzymes, then you have DNA replication. And here's an extraordinary fact. Every day, we produce around 60 billion new cells each, replicating in excess of 100 billion meters of DNA in the process. That is the distance to Mars and back. So DNA is a code, a code that holds all the information to make all living things, an instruction manual to make a worm or a cat or a fly or a human or a dinosaur. Its regularity and stability make it the perfect system for storing the vast amount of information required for building life. The information is passed to every cell of an organism because perfect copies are made prior to each cell division. And one copy of everything is distributed to each reproductive cell or gamete, according to Mendel's law, in the germline, and thence passed through the generations. Sub-revolution number seven is the cracking of the code. Convincing proof that a codon, a sequence of nucleotides that code for one amino acid, a codon is in fact three letters long, came from extremely elegant experiments in 1961 by Francis Crick, Sidney Brenner and co-workers using mutations in viruses that infect bacteria called bacteriophage. Essentially, they found that combinations of three nucleotide additions or three deletions were okay, suggesting a triplet code. The code was cracked later that same year by Nirenberg, Matai and colleagues so that individual amino acids could be associated with particular codons. The next thing that exercised the molecular biologists was the business of gene regulation, sub-revolution number eight. The problem was that if DNA codes for proteins that give cells their particular characteristics and all of the cells of an organism of a particular species contain the same DNA sequence, because the DNA sequence is, of course, the thing that defines the particular species, then how come some cells can do different things at different times in different parts of the body and so on? The breakthrough involved Jacques Monod, a young Parisian molecular biologist, and Francois Jacob, a medical student intent on becoming a surgeon. And they were working in the 1940s. After the invasion of France, Jacob served as a medic in the Free French Forces before he was badly wounded. Monod joined the resistance where he met another molecular biologist, André Luoff. After the liberation of Paris, Monod served in the French army and happened upon, in a mobile US army library, Avery's article suggesting that DNA is the hereditary material. Isn't it extraordinary that soldiers in the field were reading molecular biology papers in their spare time? With his interest in genetics rekindled, he joined Luoff after the war to work on phage and bacteria, as did Jacob, whose injuries were too severe to allow him to pursue a career in surgery. The cast of three was set. And over the next decade, one of the most creative and productive collaborations in the history of genetics worked out how genes are turned on and off with a toggle switch. In other words, the same genetic material in different cells could be interpreted in different ways to give rise to a different set of proteins. They could make a protein or not. Essentially, they found that genes govern the formation of proteins that can block the expression of other genes by binding to and acting on the DNA itself. Their findings were deduced entirely from genetic evidence, from studying the effects of mutations. In Horace Freeland Judson's wonderful book, The Eighth Day of Creation, which I would really recommend to you, describes the ferment of the whole molecular biology revolution. Jacob and Monod's work is described as making things that were utterly dark very simple. The concept of the genetic switch went far beyond bacterial enzymes and viruses. They understood and were able to articulate with exceptional eloquence how their discoveries about gene regulation pertained to the general mysteries of cell differentiation and embryonic development in animals, where the problem of the common set of genetic instructions in every cell is particularly acute. What is true for E. coli is also true for the elephant, quipped Monod. And that brings us to the end of the molecular biology revolution, which culminated in a molecular understanding of the nature of the gene, including a copying mechanism for DNA through organisms and through generations that meant that heredity and the flow of genetic information could finally be understood in a much more tangible way 
involving real molecules behaving in a way that is entirely in keeping with their structure. Thus, the grand unifying theory of genetics and evolution could now be understood at molecular resolution. So what next? My fifth major re revolution is forward genetics, and one that is very close to my heart. Using the genetic approach to understand not just hereditary mechanisms, but many other problems in biology. It had been discovered by Muller in 1927, again working on fruit flies, that bombarding an organism with X-rays or treating it with particular chemicals could induce large numbers of inherited mutations with clear effects on the morphology or the phenotype of an organism. That, of course, is because the mutations cause a change in the DNA sequence, stopping the particular proteins encoded by that DNA from working properly. And biologists started to use the genetic approach, the study of mutants, to try to understand how genes influenced other hitherto mysterious bits of biology, one of the most important of these being development. How does an organism develop from an egg to an adult? How does it end up the right size, with the right number of cells, all in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time? It seems like a problem of staggering complexity. But the problem could be reduced with the use of model organisms like Drosophila and other, others newer on the scene, like the nematode worm C. elegans introduced in the 1970s. And you can see the power of this work by looking at the phenotypes of some of the mutants. This, for example, is a fly head, uh, looking fairly average for a fly head, Drosophila head. And here's a mutant in which something goes very wrong. So what's happened here is it has legs instead of antennae. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that is quite a big thing to get wrong. <laughs> but what it does is it illustrates G the gene that causes, the, the single mutation in one gene that causes this defect is doing something really important in determining the form of the animal, putting the legs in the right place and putting the antennae in the wrong place. So by looking at a situation in which that has gone wrong, you can illuminate how that process normally works. And here's, a, here's a great paper that was written um, in 1980 by Christian nusslein volhard and Eric Vieschaus. Again, they, they were awarded a Nobel Prize eventually. And that what they did was to, to gather a whole host of interesting Drosophila mutants that illuminated different aspects of the development of that organism and how it works at this molecular level. And then C. elegans, my favourite organism, came on the scene, pioneered by Sidney Brenner in 1973. We can see here some of the first worm mutants. That's a normal worm here, this one here. And this one is short and fat. It's called a dumpy mutation. Um, and this one is much longer than it should be, and this one, again, is a bit smaller. So that illustrates something very interesting about, about how animal size is regulated. How, how is it that all different animals all grow to a particular kind of size? And again, using a mutant in which that goes wrong, you can understand how that process normally works. So this approach had been used since the 1920s, but it took on a new vigour in the 1970s and 1980s. Firstly, because biologists now understood the nature of the gene and could map mutants using Morgan's discovery of linkage and the chromosome theory. Secondly, because techniques became established for working out the sequence of DNA. And thirdly, because it became possible to make transgenic animals. That meant that the precise gene that had gone wrong in the mutants could be pinpointed. And also that DNA could be isolated in vitro, mucked about with and then introduced into an organism like a fly or a worm or a yeast cell or even a mouse. This approach has now blown apart much of biology. We now understand, for example, much of the molecular details of how cell division is controlled, how cells in embryos take on the correct identity, how cells and axons migrate to the right destination, how gender is determined at the molecular level, how some cells undergo programmed cell death. The list is extremely long, and I could name examples for several hours. What's more, because of the techniques of transgenesis, it was possible to introduce DNA from one species into another. Paul Nurse pioneered this approach in the 1980s, showing that the human counterpart of the yeast CDC2 gene was able to rescue yeast mutants that were unable to grow properly because they had a defect in their CDC2 gene. In other words, the human genes and yeast genes were very similar. Their function was said to be conserved. This was crucially important because it meant that, as had been suspected previously, 
Work on simple organisms ultimately informs our knowledge of human biology and disease. Model organisms became biomedically significant. Using the genetic approach, we've even begun to understand how lifespan is genetically programmed. Here's a lifespan curve of some worms, normal ones, and a DAF2 mutant, right? A mutation in one gene is causing these worms to live much longer than they should. So it's showing the age at which worms die. Isn't that extraordinary? We can even start to understand how behavior is controlled. These, are again, are some worm mutants, normal ones, um, and, and mutant ones. Actually, they're not quite mutants there because they're, they're naturally occurring mutations. They haven't, been, um, they haven't been induced by some sort of chemical, um, but they come from Australia. And what they do is they like to gather together in groups and be very social, whereas the ones from England, <laughs> kind of a bit, they're loners. But this illustrates wonderfully how you can use the genetic approach to understand behavior. Because the only thing that, these, that, that differentiates these two worms is a mutation in one gene. And the really, so the really revolutionary thing about forward genetics is its unbiased approach. The investigator observes a bunch of mutants until he or she finds one that displays a defect in the process under investigation, thus revealing an important mechanism and one that can be understood at the biochemical level once the sequence of the mutant gene is revealed. The work is unbiased because no assumptions are made about the biochemistry of the process under investigation. Phenotypic analysis leads the geneticist to the important genes. A geneticist cannot be fussy about what kinds of genes and what kinds of proteins they want to work on because the, geneti because, because the genetics can lead them anywhere. They're led purely and simply by phenotype. The work is still going on, of course, but we've made massive progress in the last 40 years in using genetics to understand how life works. And this extraordinary effort is my fifth major revolution in genetics, using mutants to understand anything in biology that is genetically programmed, which is pretty much everything in biology. My sixth and penultimate revolution in genetics is genome sequencing and genomics. And this work was started by Fred Sanger in 1977. And Fred Sanger had already developed a method for determining the amino acid sequence of proteins back in the 1950s, and then he did it for DNA, and that's why he ended up with two Nobel Prizes. But once the technique for sequencing small stretches of DNA was worked out, the next thing was to scale up and sequence a whole genome, ushering in the field of genomics, the study of whole genomes. The bacterium Haemophilus Hemoph influenza was the first free-living organism to be sequenced in 1995, followed by yeast, 1996. The first multicellular animal, C. elegans, 1998. Fruit fly, 2000. And the human genome, first draft in 2001, completed in 2003. This was an extraordinary achievement involving many hundreds of different workers from all over the world over a period of around 13 years, and costing around $2.7 billion. billion. If you typed the whole human genome out at 200 letters per minute, it would take you 29 years with no breaks. And yet, we've got that inside every single one of our 40 trillion cells, and our enzymatic machines can copy it in a matter of minutes. We've now got to the point in human history, said John Solston, shown here, who spearheaded the project in the UK and also worked tirelessly to ensure that the data remained in the public domain. We've now got to the point in human history where, for the first time, we're going to hold in our hands the set of instructions to make a human being. What's even more extraordinary than this, though, is what's happened since. The technology has developed so fast that it's now possible to sequence the human genome for under $1,000 in a matter of hours. Thousands of different kinds of organisms have had their genome sequenced. The tsunami of data is so huge that this is of itself a problem in terms of storage alone, let alone analysis. It was estimated back in 2013, that was two years ago, that biologists around the world um, churn out 13 petabases of sequence a year. One petabase is one million gigabases, which is a thousand megabases. If this were stored on regular DVDs, the resulting stack would be 2.2 miles tall every year. 
And I bet you now we're producing data at a much, much higher rate than we were in 2013. So this sixth revolution provides challenges, as we, as we shall see is also the case for the seventh and last revolution. It's easy to be dazzled by the possible uses of genome information. Sequencing the genome of your cancer cells may allow oncologists to tailor-make your treatment to increase the chances of success. The speculation is that healthcare professionals will eventually be able to use genomic information to predict what diseases a person may get in the future and attempt to minimise the risk or even eliminate it altogether through the implementation of personalised preventative medicine. That's not at all straightforward, though largely because human disease is rarely caused by mutations in a single gene that can be easily traced, such as cystic fibrosis. Most disease, such as heart disease or cancer or mental illness, will result from an extremely complex interaction of many different genes with each other and with the environment. There's a public misconception that scientists are discovering the genes for disease on a daily basis, not to mention the genes for characteristics such as binge drinking, or forgetfulness, or intelligence, or beauty. Very little in human biology is straightforwardly deterministic at the genetic level. Genomics is best, better understood as probabilistic. A whole host of genetic factors contribute to the odds, but the outcome is decided by an even greater range of genetic, biological, and environmental influences. Thus, I do not think that we need to take too gloomy and dystopian a view of medical genomics. It's true that there are ethical debates to be had around single gene disorders. What about late-onset diseases with no cure? Would you want to know? If you decide to know, then what about your family? Doesn't your diagnosis affect them too? Supposing they don't want to know, what are the psychological impacts? Could there be genetic discrimination? But it's simply just not going to be possible to devise simple genetic tests for intelligence or creativity, thank goodness, or even heart disease, diabetes, or schizophrenia. It's just too complicated. I'm sure there'll be an explosion of, of internet companies offering such tests in the future. They should probably be banned, not because they might give you devastating information, but because they will almost certainly give you misleading information. A probabilistic view, on the other hand, might tell you how best to avoid your own personal risks. Part of me thinks, however, that this will probably boil down to eating less fat, drinking less alcohol, and taking more exercise. And where have we heard that before? I don't want to give you the impression that genomics poses no social or ethical challenges. There are questions of ownership, privacy, and access, and certainly need for debate. The debate needs to be had between well-informed stakeholders who understand the science, not lobby groups with a particular agenda. So that is the sixth revolution in genetics, the genomic revolution. The outcome of this revolution is as yet unclear, but one thing that is certain is that genome sequence information brings all of life closer together than it was ever thought possible. It's a more modern version of Darwin's tree. Literally thousands of genome sequences are now available, and comparative genomics allows us to interrogate evolutionary relationships between different species with more resolution than ever before. DNA is not just an instruction manual for the making of an organism. It's also a history book a historical record of all the genetic mutations that have happened by chance to make us what we are and to make everything else what it is. We're all related through an unbroken chain of many billions of copyings through four billion years. Imagine how excited Darwin and Mendel would have been if they'd known all this. My final revolution in genetics, however, the seventh revolution, also takes us into the future. But this revolution unlike the genomics revolution, has only just begun. It's genome editing using what is called the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Geneticists have developed several techniques for genome editing, or changing the genetic makeup of organisms by causing targeted change in the nucleotide sequence in the past. But the revolutionary thing about CRISPR-Cas9 is that it works with extremely high efficiency and is very versatile. So what on earth is it? The technique makes use of the natural immune defences of bacteria, which have come up with molecular scissors to remove unwanted DNA. For example, DNA transferred by an infecting virus. 
These molecular scissors, or nucleases, the Cas9, can cut out sections of DNA with extreme precision. They can be guided to cut the precise bits of DNA to be modified by, in, in experiments by a synthetically made guide RNA that directs the cut through hybridization with its matching genomic sequence. When the cell repairs the break, errors can occur to generate a knockout of that gene or additional modifications can be introduced. This technology therefore has the potential to rewrite the genetic code. Genetic conditions could therefore be treated by modifying the DNA of affected cells, like rubbing out so many typos. There's also the possibility of radical uh, new therapies for a range of diseases. Although single gene disorders are rare, if you add them up, they affect an awful lot of people. So collectively, they're not rare. Genetic Alliance UK estimates that 5.5% of the UK population suffer from one of 6,000 Mendelian, i.e. diseases caused by a mutation in just one gene, Mendelian diseases by age 25. That's 3.5 million people. So the impact of genome editing in these patients and their families could be enormous. Human embryos could also be modified, such that the disease-causing mutation... Oops, sorry such that the disease causing mutation is overridden, not just in that individual, but in their children, their children's children, and so on. Is this a good plan? Research institutions, funders, and scientists have called for a renewed debate on the ethics of modifying human embryos before the science gets ahead of public opinion. The overwhelming view of scientists at present is that the procedure is too new to know how safe it is. And one big concern is that a public backlash could impact on the race to develop new and safe therapies. So do we go out bravely to meet this vision, as Thucydides would have said, glory and danger alike? Is this playing God? Is editing the human germline a line that should never be crossed? Is it the first step on the road to designer babies? Whatever we may think about the answer to this question, one thing is resoundingly clear. Talking about it is essential, like for genome-based diagnosis. Public debate must be at a high level, with all parties understanding the science, such that rhetoric doesn't get to replace fact. Public trust in science depends on openness, transparency, and effective regulation. And this is the approach that must be taken. There's no scientific answer to what is the right response to the potential use of technology. That answer has to be provided by society. The amazing thing for me about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is that, once again, evolution shows us the way. Evolution has come up with these remarkable enzymes, and we have the privilege of being intelligent enough to make use of them. So this brings me full circle, from Darwin and his lack of a theory of heredity, through Mendel, Morgan, the DNA folk, to genomics and genome editing. This has been a whistle-stop tour, and I've left out countless important revolutions on the way, including Barbara McClintock's work on jumping genes or transposable elements, showing that genomes are not static at all, but highly dynamic, changing. I've left out technological innovations, such as PCR and gene cloning, that paved the way for the revolution in genome editing. I've left out newish ideas about epigenetics and revolutions in the RNA world. In fact, genetics is so exciting and revolutionary that it's hardly possible to say anything at all in an hour. If I were to sum up what I've said in one sentence, it would be to note the extraordinary counterpoint in biology between astonishing variety on the one hand, yet astonishing constancy in fundamental mechanisms on the other. I'm sure that you will agree with me that the revolutions are, if anything, gaining in momentum. So we're in for exciting times. If you were to ask JBS Haldane about the future of biology, he would say the following. In forecasting the future of scientific research, there is one quite general law to be noted. The unexpected always happens. So one can be quite sure that the future will make any detailed predictions look silly. Yet an actual research worker can perhaps see a little further than the intelligent onlooker. Even so, it may seem presumptuous for any one man, woman in this case, especially one who is almost completely ignorant of botany, to attempt to cover, however inadequately, 
the whole field of biological investigation. I hope you will forgive me my terrible oversights if I end with another quote from Haldane. My own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Thank you.